This video has been supported by Skillshare. Hey guys, I'm getting more and more free product for review invitations. Sadly, I can accept fewer than ever because of this time-consuming CNC project. But when Ben Q offered to send me this partially wooden stand, I couldn't refuse. Look, it's somewhat vibration cancelling with this rubber layer. And it's tilted. Incredible. They also threw in one of their electrostatic Bluetooth speakers to make the stand look useful. This device has been featured in an EEV block episode already. I don't think I can add a lot to that, but Dave didn't have the stand, so I can at least focus on that. No, for real though, this thing is designed quite beautifully. And it's small, sturdy and metallic on all sides for backpackability. You know what's also small, sturdy and metallic on all sides? We'll get to that in a second. It sounds best in one or two meter distance, I think. It's very directional and it likes to have a bit of space behind it. It can definitely do loud. But that's not really the purpose of this product, I think. It takes a special wine-drinking, jazz-discussing clientele to even know what an electrostatic speaker is. I'm none of those, so you've got to take my word with a grain of salt. I don't think that this is what's usually meant by electrostatic speaker. They seem to use a much thinner metal mesh and film sandwich. Normally, you've got to have two stator plates with high opposing voltages and a diaphragm in the middle that gets attracted or repelled by the status depending on its own voltage. This thing uses a rather complicated electric diaphragm that stores a permanent static charge and gets pushed back and forth by varying voltages on the stators. An electric diaphragm comprising an electric layer, at least comprising ethylene group polymer and a bonding layer, adhere to a surface of the electric layer, wherein a material of the bonding layer comprises ethylene ethyl acrylate. E and so on and so on. I'm not feeling tricked by this marketing title because they do rely on the same electrostatic coulomb force. They are just a budget version with similar advantages and disadvantages. On one side, the large area low mass electric tweeters give them a fantastic clarity and resolution for high frequencies. They can't however make real air pressure for those window shattering bases. For that, they have to be supported by this central woofer assembly and its passive radiators. With that disconnected, there is barely anything left. Here's an example of just the electrodes on their own. Here's an example of just the electrodes on their own. But with everything back in its place, it's quite an exquisite little Bluetooth stand. And in comparison to other candidates from that category, it sounds fantastic. And now it's time to give it a proper hi-fi input signal. With a proper crusty coax to headphone jack adapter. I have neither reel-to-reel -reel deck nor a record player though. Experts agree on those being the only trustworthy sources of hi-fi audio, so I guess I've got to make one. This is more or less the status at the end of the previous episode. The X and Y axes are pretty much done. The Z axis is prepared, but missing a big plate. To connect a tool, or let's call it needle today, to the linear hardware. I've asked around and scanned eBay for an affordable piece. To no avail, I ended up having to pay the full price for this beauty. This is a pre-ground 1000 by 200 by 30 mm steel plate. One might call it a long boy. An expensive boy. A heavy boy. A few comments were asking where I got my parts CNC'd. So I asked the guy if he wanted to make an appearance. He said yes, so I held back the info a little longer. Expecting that higher demand might hike up his very good prices. He's been a huge help in this huge project. For example, by correcting mistakes in my amateurish drawings before they became reality. 
So let me introduce you to the mistakeless Z-axis plate. Courtesy of CNC Zerspannung Hanover. Link below. It's still a heavy boy, but there are only 600 mm left. It needs the same treatment that the other axes had. You know the drill. And it needs the same kind of meticulous cleanliness, of course. I did this press fit reference rail again, but I'm officially not recommending it. It requires higher torque than the manufacturer's specification, so in an unlucky case deformation can't be ruled out. The proper way of doing it is to press the reference rail sideways against only one reference edge, and then to torque it down gently according to spec. That's much more fail-safe and only marginally more difficult. Nothing wrong though with a press fit motor mount, that was really satisfying. In the design of this axis I have completely ignored the fact that I would have to install it eventually. And this precarious situation is a direct consequence of that. Safety socks and engineering helmet mandatory. I can't access all the bolts all the time, so what to install where and how to maintain squareness and cleanliness becomes a complex problem. Eventually I managed to pull it off by gently coaxing everything into place simultaneously. But for future reference, planning ahead would have been much easier. So after months of hard work, we finally have three axes in motion. Just in case you can't tell from my vocal tone, I'm immeasurably excited about that. There's still a lot left to do, like shortening the Z-axis ball screw, installing an oil-based central lubrication system, adding or replacing the 3D printed bearing blocks and motor holders, fixing the enclosure's vibration issues, Actually, I expect that adding the 3mm steel sidewalls will give the enclosure enough rigidity to take care of that problem. These sexy polycarbonate windows are giving me a lot of rigidity, if you know what I mean. I literally couldn't move a muscle after spending hours installing these rebellious rubber seals. What did you think? I also need way covers to protect the precious machinery from everything and to protect the idiot of an operator from the precious machinery. Does any of it matter for our CNC record player though? No idea to be honest. I think there are two viable strategies. We could allow the needle to rotate and add a slip ring for the cables or something. That would be easy mode because the needle could follow the tracks almost on its own. And stereo could be preserved because the needle would mostly point in the right direction. Or we could mount it rigidly, combine the two stereo channels and rely on the micrometer machine to follow the tracks around. Option 1 is pretty boring and I don't even have a slip ring for the cables, so I can only do one revolution at a time. Whoa, whoa, one revolution is plenty, no worries. The outside circumference of a record is almost a meter and the slowest ones want to be rotated at 35 rpm. The resulting 3500 mm per minute speed requirement is a little bit fast for a machine that still has 3D printed parts. But as I said, I don't have another record player for comparison, so I can only assume that that was exactly the kind of bootleg noise core that was on that LP. Rigid mounting, in my opinion, is much more interesting anyway, because we can torture vinyl aficionados a little more and pretend to be a surface roughness meter. A less agonizing sound indicates a better surface quality. 
Wow, this is surprisingly difficult. I've tried a number of parameters, but I'm still getting no more than demonic gibberish. I mean, I don't know for a fact what's supposed to be on that LP, but it feels like I'm close to the correct settings. To be able to test a lot of settings easily, I've modified a neat spiral G-code from the Linux CNC forum. It builds a spiral from a number of helices and it approximates those with a number of straight lines. That number can be configured with a resolution variable. Aha, see, demonic gibberish after all. Nah, it's fake, I'll admit it, but I'll work on it a little bit more. I think I really need a record that is made for playing at 35 RPM. Then, hardware-wise, I think I should be able to make it happen. The online learning platform Skillshare doesn't have any content about DIY record players yet, but a steadily growing collection of thousands of other high-quality classes, like music production, mechanical and electronic engineering for example. A premium membership gives you unlimited access to all of them. That way you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities and do the work you love. In relation to the beginning of this video, I found this speaker design course absolutely enlightening. It contains all the in-depth information and it's presented nicely by an authentic expert in the field. Skillshare is also more affordable than other online learning platforms with an annual subscription costing less than $10 a month. If you are one of the first 500 to sign up with the link in the description, you're getting two months for free altogether. So give it a try and that's about it. See you next time. By the way, this steel toe safety sock joke is a good one, but after almost involuntarily impact testing mine, I'll have to overthink my workwear policy. But not right away, just carry on for now.